that hour. <laughs> so that's all you gotta do. That's all you gotta do. You gotta get to the gym, right? And then you can shower. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to get you on Monday and I'm going to Let's turn to 373. 373. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my fortune, and it be great to serve to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he Oh, dear, his soul, because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby. And feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face in certain days because he lives. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is so because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day i'll cross the river i'll fight life's fight no war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is so. Because I know. Holds the future and life.
life is worth the living just because he lives. Someone have a number? Three seventy four. Three hundred and seventy four. Bless all my soul, the living God. Call all thy thoughts that roll the road. Let all the powers within me join in praise and worship so divine. Bless all my soul, the God of grace. His favors claim the highest praise. Let not the wonders he hath wrought be Oh. 
Number 89. Number five.
Number 111. I
Good morning. Good morning. Good to see each one of you this morning. Uh, it's good that we are able uh, to assemble ourselves once more in the house of the Lord this morning. I hope and trust that each one of you have offered up prayer on behalf of this service that we can come together and worship in the name of the Lord, uh, that we would rejoice, uh, that we would grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We hope and trust that uh, the Lord would bless us this morning, and that would be the case. Um, happy Father's Day uh, to uh, the fathers out here this morning. It says, history tells us, that in 1909 or 1910 in the United States, that that was when Father's Day had its roots in 1972, then they made it a holiday. But you know, scripture tells us, and so the United States has set a day out for fathers and mothers and, you know, things of that nature. But the Bible uh, says this, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. This was written way before 1908, 1910. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. So we see all throughout scriptures that children are taught to be obedient, respectful, and obey and love their parents. So we hope to remember that, uh, and certainly on this day, uh, we say Happy Father's Day. Uh, but uh, the scripture was before that, and it promoted the, the same idea, but not just on a certain day. To love means that, to obey and to trust and uh, and likewise. So anyway, as we mo move on with our worship service this morning, uh, we'd like to welcome all the members as well as visitors. It's good to have our visitors with us this morning. Um, so we hope and trust that uh, they'll be made to feel at home uh, in the Lord's house. As we go to the Lord in prayer, um, we have many that we want to try and remember uh, Sister Jewel is pretty low. She's uh, pretty much confined to the bed. Um, we were able to speak with her uh, Friday. Uh, she seems to be rest restful, not restless. Um, uh, able to uh, lift her head up and to speak and to talk. So we hope and trust that the Lord would bless her and just give her peace and mercy. Uh, she... Uh, worked all her life. I think everybody that knows knows her knows that. Uh, and uh, she said lately that she's really tired, just really tired, just really tired. So we pray for her rest and her family. So we remember Sister Jewel. Uh, Clyde Pickler has been in the hospital. He was in the hospital from Monday to Saturday, from what I understand. Anita her sister Kathy is uh, down there trying to make sure he's okay and to try to uh, get things in order for him to come back and be closer here with them. So we want to remember Clyde and Anita and Kathy and their families as uh, uh, this time with Clyde is uh, progressing. So we pray the Lord's blessing in that. Uh, sister Wanda wanted to send her thanks to the church at the passing of her daughter Juanelle in the remembrance of her and travel and with prayers and cards and calls and a beautiful plant that was sent on behalf of Metacritic to her. So she said, thank you very much. She also asked uh, if the Lord, if we would remember her in prayer as uh, she has some uh, upcoming appointments, to, the Lord would bless her with wisdom when it comes to a uh, heart ablation or a pacemaker that the Lord would help and lead, guide, and direct her in the way that uh, she would go. So we just pray the Lord would be in the matter. Um, Donna Burris, we want to remember her. Her husband has got COVID, so we pray the Lord's blessing upon uh, them. 
uh, Susan, we, Susan Honeycutt, Sister Susan, we want to remember her, hope and trust her knee is uh, better and as well as it was anyway. Um, my brother Tim and his family aren't here today. They've, uh, from what I understand, has been exposed this past week. Uh, uh, brother Tim said he tested negative on Tuesday, uh, but just to be on the safe side. Uh, they're keeping their distance. Um, so we hope and trust that uh, they continue to stay healthy. Um, Elder Joe Helms and uh, Brother Mike and Sister Robin and Brother Joseph all have COVID, uh, as well as uh, Charles Helms's in-laws and things of that nature. So a lot in that area right there uh, have had COVID. They all seem to be doing pretty well. So we pray the Lord's blessing in that. We remember Brother Gene and Sister Virginia, uh, Sister Ruth and her brother Robert. We pray the Lord's continued blessing upon them. Brother Josh and his upcoming wedding, Cassie and her engagement. We hope and trust the Lord would continue to bless them. A few from No Creek, if we can remember, Sister Lib Massey's uh, uh, very low. So we pray the Lord's blessing with her, uh, Sister Edna, Sister Bennett, Sister Merlin. Of Mary Catherine and Regina, we pray the Lord's continu continued blessing upon them as well as um, the Edisons. Uh, so we hope and trust that the Lord would comfort them. Uh, we remember this country in which we live. We hope and trust the Lord would continue to bless us with mercy and grace, uh, bless our leaders. Uh, we are instructed in the scripture uh, to be thankful in all things, and we are thankful for the place in which we live. We're thankful for the leaders that we have. So we pray the Lord's blessing upon them. Uh, we're thankful for our military. We ask the Lord's continued blessing upon uh, them to encourage them, our law enforcement officers. Uh, we want to remember Chase Sawyers. Uh, we mentioned him uh, our last time meeting uh, in his continued recovery. Uh, he was shot in the line of duty, we remember, and we hope and trust that the Lord would bless his recovery. Uh, so we want to remember our law enforcement officers as well as our first responders. Uh, we just pray the Lord's blessing upon them. Uh, pray the Lord's continued blessing uh, upon this little spot right here at Meta Creek. We pray the Lord would continue to bless and stir us up in the spirit. Uh, we, we hope and trust that as we come to meet uh, together today that uh, we would be made stronger in the spirit, we would be strengthened in the spirit, and that we would be able to look on and rejoice in spiritual things, spiritual things this morning. Uh, so we hope and trust that the Lord would uh, revive us that we may praise his holy name. Is there anyone else we'd like to add to this list? All righty. No one being added to this, we'd like to stand and sing a hymn as a way of opening and ask uh, Brother Kevin, if he would, to come forward and uh, lead us in prayer, pray for him, pray with him. I think I did fail to mention our worship, our song service. Uh, we're thankful for it. Uh, we're thankful for the spirit that we have to sing these hymns, and uh, we're thankful to the Lord for our song leaders. Brother Gene, what number? Number 63. Number 63. <laughs> Down at the feet of Jesus, I go in humble prayer, seeking His broken spirit to find the comfort there.
tried to sing songs of praise unto thy great name. That we could feel thy spirit as it come to dwell with us. Lord, that we could be found worshiping, in, worshiping thee in spirit and in truth. We thank thee for this opportunity and we pray, Lord, that thou would continue to be with us. Even if we felt thee in thy presence, we ask, Lord, that thou would Fill us now through the preaching of the gospel that it might be that the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit would come and dwell in our house that it might witness with the Spirit that's within us. We pray that thou would give us an attentive ear and that would lift up our hearts that it might see the beautiful gospel, Lord, that thou hast preserved for us, for us in thy word. We know, Lord, that thou hast kept it. We know that thou hast preserved it, and we give thee thanks, Lord. We ask that thou would bless it to this, to our service at this time. We ask that thou would bless Brother Eddie as he's to come before us, that he's to stand before us and bring those things that we would need. That thou hast laid upon his heart, Lord. Now that thou would help him, embolden him, Lord. Give him strength. Give him through thy power. Give him what he needs in this hour. Help him and all of us, Lord, to purge those things that would be a hindrance unto us, Lord, that we could, for a small moment of time, put, our, put away those things in this life, and that we would be focused solely on our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his love for life, his people. We thank you, Lord, for this time together, and we ask, Lord, that thou would be with us as we go further. But first, we'd like to give thee thanks for all that thou has afforded unto us. Thou hast given unto us in this natural world, Lord, the things that we stand in need of. Thou hast been plentiful and gracious, merciful. God, thou hast given us everything that we need and then more. Many times, Lord, we're so complacent that we would not even give thee thanks for the, those things that thou hast richly and bountifully given unto us. Help us, Lord, to be thankful. Give us a thankful heart. Help us to be gracious. And give thee all the praise and honor. For we know that thou art the giver of all good things. All Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from thee. We ask, Lord, that thou would be with those that are sick and afflicted. We've heard many today. We ask that thou would be with Sister Jewel and her family. We ask, Lord, that thou would give her strength. We know that this way is a weary way. And it's a tiresome way in this, in this life. But we know, Lord, that thou is great physician that Amen. I can give rest and I can heal. We pray, Lord, for thy delivering hand that, that it would be well with her in either case. We thank the Lord for those that we've heard that are, have recovered from sickness. We give thee praise and honor for that. And we pray for those that are still sick and afflicted and recovering. Lord, be with each one in each case. We ask, Lord, that thou would be with our country, as Brother Eddie has mentioned, those that serve those that have devoted their lives to the service and protection of this land, that we would have the freedom to worship today as we have this opportunity. We thank you, Lord, that thou hast given us those that would lay down their lives for that cause. 
But we know, Lord, there is a greater cause. The cause of your church and the kingdom of that life that thou has put on this earth. And help us, Lord, that we might be willing to lay down our lives as it were. That we would be a good sacrifice of all that we have for the cause of Christ. But we know that under the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ is that was brought our salvation. And Lord, we know we can't repay thee, but help us, Lord, to worship thee in a way that can give thee honor. We know, Lord, as we can say like David, that they're not a cause. But we should press ourselves into this kingdom, Lord, and fight on for the sake of our Lord and Savior for all that he's given unto us. We thank thee, Lord, for thy love and kindness and thy salvation. We ask, Lord, that thou would go with us, lead us and guide us in all that we do. We know, Lord, that thou hast conquered and thou hast yet reigning. And one day we'll be delivered and we'll be with thee in the resurrection that will lift us up. And we'll be changed and fitted for service in, thy, in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for that. And we ask all these blessings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're thankful uh, for that prayer. We hope and trust that you'll continue to pray. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles uh, and you'd like to follow along, open up to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Certainly, thinking of the prayer in which we've just heard that we're thankful for uh, all the many people that stand uh, for the cause in which the United States was, promotes in many regards, but as Brother Kevin said, there is truly a greater cause. There is truly a greater cause. We hope and trust that the Lord would strengthen us to uh, fight in that cause. So Isaiah chapter 55, uh, verse 10 uh, through verse 13, well, verse 8, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, reading to the end of this chapter. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace and the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name and for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So uh, we ask the Lord's blessing in, uh, this morning. We hope this is of the Lord. Uh, we'd like to focus our attention on verse 10 and 11 here for a few moments. Uh, and uh, what, what I'd like to try to speak about is the Word of God, the Word of God. And as we think about that, uh, we have to distinguish which word that we're talking about, not the 
tens of thousands of words in the scripture, well, because we can say that the scripture, this Bible is the word of God. Now, this word of God is holy and just in the sense that it's given by God, that it's without error. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. We see in the book of Psalms, in Psalms chapter 12, verse 6, the words, that's, that's talking from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation, the words of God, every word in this holy Bible, and we believe that the King James uh, English, English version or translation of this Bible is inerrant. It says it's the word of God. The words of the Lord are pure words, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. So what that verse is telling us is that the words of God, the Bible, is pure words. It's been, it's been tried, so to speak, as furnace, as uh, silver in the furnace. There's no imperfections or impurities in this Bible. I hope and believe, I hope that you believe and trust in that. It would be uh, a sore occasion to to want to learn about God and to wonder when you're reading the scripture, if all of these things are true. But dearly beloved, every word is true in scripture. Every word is true. So that's a word of God. Now we also know that there's another word, so to speak, of God. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word. Now that word, when it's speaking there, is not speaking about this written word, but it's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And there was not anything that was made that was made not by this word. Does that make sense? So you see the difference there. Now that's very important to understand the difference between the word of God being the Lord and the words of God being holy just. I mean, they're righteous. They're, they're right. They're true. They have different purposes in this world. The words of God gives us information and knowledge about God. This does not give us life. This written word of God does not give us life, but the word of God gives us life. You like how that said? So you have to rightly divide that. John 1, 1, that word gives us life. The words of God does not give us life. You know, and the gospel is preached from this word, this written word. Now, I think the... I believe I can find this real quickly. <clears throat> you know, John the Baptist was given the task of be giving us knowledge or introducing or showing us, pointing us to Jesus Christ. And the word of God and the gospel does this in Luke chapter one, verse 77. I'm just going to read a verse. Don't turn there. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. These words of God gives us knowledge of our salvation. Does that make sense? In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, notice what the words or the gospel does. The gospel does not give us life. It brings this life to light. Let's see, 2 Timothy. Who hath saved us, in uh, verse 10, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, 
Who hath abolished death? He, Jesus Christ abolished death, not the scripture. The scripture did not abolish death, but the word, which is Christ, abolished death and brought life in, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel, the word of the Lord, in that sense, brings all that to light, that we have an understanding of it. Do you see that? Do you see the difference? But I want us to notice this. In verse in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, it says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So I want us to look at this and see which word that's being spoken of here. Because the word that's being spoken of here says it goeth forth from the Lord and it shall accomplish that whereto it was sent. Does that make sense? It shall not, be, it shall not come back void. To come back void means it comes back empty handed. It comes back uh, not completing or not being completely, uh, it didn't get it done. It comes back void. For example, so I'd like to show you some examples of where in some instances, this, the word of God, not John, not Jesus Christ, the word of God, he speaks it. And it, in, in a sense, comes back void because it does not accomplish the things in which God said it should accomplish or spoke to someone to accomplish this and it came back void. Does that make sense? What I'm saying is not all the time is the Word of God obeyed by those whom the Word of God is spoken to. But sometimes the Word of God, when God speaks it, it accomplishes what it was supposed to do. Are you thinking, what is he trying to, what's he talking about? I wanted to see instances in Scripture when God speaks. And it doesn't come back void, but it accomplishes that. Let's look at Genesis chapter one. I mean, we could go through that whole, and we see an example. We see the intended effect of what God is intending, and we seeing him accomplish what he is intending to accomplish, save none. It does not come back void. Genesis one, seven. And God made, made is a synonym for accomplished, and God accomplished, God, so let's look at the word that God said. God said, let there be light, or God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. God said it. That word did not come back void because we see in the next Verse chapter seven, verse seven, and God made the firmaments and divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Verse number three, chapter one, and God said, the word of God said, let there be light. God said, let there be light. Did that come back void? Absolutely not. It accomplished what God sent it to accomplish. I would say that it pleased God that it would accomplish that. Because, and we go, you can go through, and the reason I would say that is because at the end of this chapter, and God saw everything that he had made, that he had spoken into existence. The word of God, that's, the word that comes from God is very powerful. You remember when Jesus, when they came to arrest him at the garden? And he said, it is I that the soldiers fell backward there's power in that word. And we can go through many examples in scripture, but also I want us to notice that sometimes when God gives instruction through his prophets, that not all the time those words were obeyed and in that sense, those instructions came back void. Does that make sense? Do you see how 
God's commandment to his people was given by the prophet, which was given to the prophet by God. So these are the words, the words of God given to the prophet to give to the people and the people do not obey. So in that sense, they kind of come back or they come back void. They did not accomplish. Now, notice what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 6. Now, I think we all understand that the words that Jeremiah spoke came from God. He was a prophet called from God, as well as the prophet Isaiah, as well as the prophets listed in the scripture. Now, the scripture does talk about many false prophets, but these aren't considered false prophets because they spoke what God instructed them to speak. And yet, there are many of God's people which hear the word of God and do not hearken unto it. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, well, this says, this is, this is the word of God. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Now, if that word, if those people were obedient to that word, and it would not come back void, then they would ask for those old paths and they would seek those good ways and they would find rest for their soul. But I want you to notice this next verse. It says, but they said, we will not walk therein. That word came back void. It did not accomplish. Those were children of Israel in which God had chosen earlier in the in biblical times. They were children of Israel and they would not hearken unto the word of the prophet which was the word of God. We will not walk therein. Also, I set watchmen over you saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Therefore hear ye nations and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, and behold, you will not hearken unto the word of God in this world. I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. They rejected this prophecy or this prophetic word of God. And when we go through the New Testament, we see children of God hearing the word of God and rejecting it, not being obedient to it. And in that sense, I think we can be in agreement that that word came back void. Do you remember the parable of the sower? He goes forth to throw, to sow the word of God. What was the purpose of the parable of the sower? Well, the sower needs to keep sowing, but it was that those that would hear it would bring forth fruit. And if they all broke forth fruit, you can say that that did not come back void, but it accomplished where to it was sent. But we see that Many did not have good ground to receive the seed on, and they didn't bear fruit. That word came back void. They did bear fruit for a little while, and it was kind of stolen away. So the purpose that I want us to see is this written word of God, this gospel, this inspired word of God within the pages of the scripture can be spoken, but it does not yield the fruit in which it's intended to yield. Now back to Isaiah chapter 15. So uh, 55. So let us speak about the word of the Lord that does accomplish what it's sent to accomplish. Aren't you thankful that there's a word that goes forth to accomplish what it's sent to accomplish? So let's identify the word. Let's see who sent it and what is it supposed to accomplish and if it was accomplished. And in that, we shall go forth with joy and be led forth with peace. And we will be like the mountains and the hills that break forth into singing. So shall my, well, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. We know that the Lord, well, let's just go to John chapter 1, 1. I want us to um, make sure that we have an understanding of who we're speaking about this being the word. 
the word that went forth and accomplished that whereto it was sent. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. You notice that in this word is life and this written word of God is not life. There does not need to be two life givers. In Christ, in that word is life. I just want us to see this distinct, distinction, if I can find the scripture right fast. Peter. <clears throat> First Peter, uh, he writes this. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit and to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with the pure with a pure heart fervently, being born, that's giving, being given life. This is talking about spiritual life. Being born not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. This word of God that gives us life is the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, who is God, and in the beginning was with God. It is not this written word that we're born of, but it's by the seed of Christ in which we're born. You see the distinction there? This written word does not give us life, but the holy word Jesus Christ gives us life. In the Hebrew letter, Hebrews Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 we see the word identified here and this word is of the Lord Jesus Christ for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart do you remember time after time it says this word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts you remember when jesus was speaking the word jesus christ the word is speaking with pharisees and sadducees and he would ask a question but he says i know knowing the intents or the purposes or the purpose of their heart he knew their thoughts, he knew their desires, he knew the intent of their heart. That word. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The world, the, the worlds that were framed were not framed by these words, but it was framed by the word of God and the word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. So that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. So do you see the distinction between the words of God, the scripture and the word of God? the Lord Jesus Christ. So what was, what was this word's purpose? It says, this word shall go with forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me empty handed or without accomplishment, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing, it shall prosper, it shall grow, it shall be effectual in the thing whereto I sent it. You know, in the gospel accounts, it says that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to work the work of him that sent me, to finish the work the Father had sent him to do. So Jesus Christ was sent with a purpose into this world. Do you believe that this morning? That the purpose, there was a specific purpose. You know, and it says, so shall my word be. As we look in verse 10, it says, for as the rain cometh down, there's a specific purpose for the rain and the snow given to us in this scripture. The purpose for the rain and the snow, and it says it's not going to return 
until it waters the earth and it brings forth bud and the fruit and it gives seed to the sower. Were you able to eat this morning? Did you have something to eat? That tells us that this scripture is coming true. Who sends the rain and who sends the snow? Who made the rain and who made the snow? There's only one that sends it. You ask the farmers of this, uh, this, this area of the, of the world we live. There's a tremendous amount of farming that goes on in this area. You ask them, well, I can speak of one, Curtis, Brother Curtis Fur. I mean, he farms, what, thousands of acres? He'll tell you who sends the rain and who sends the snow. He'll let you know if we don't get the rain or we don't get the snow and it doesn't come forth and accomplish what it's sent to do, we will not have food. So we can see, we can see with our natural eyes, this natural example, that this in which God has sent is accomplishing that which it's sent to accomplish. So the joining word, so shall Jesus Christ accomplish what he was sent to accomplish. You know, and I'm so happy today to uh, let us know that, or let everybody know and uh, promote the truth of the Bible in which Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, being sent from God, accomplished fully. Because remember, he was sent back. He that descended shall ascend. He did ascend, and he ascended victoriously. So what did Jesus Christ accomplish when he went to the cross? You know, uh, Jesus Christ would explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to accomplish what the Father had sent him to do. But I want us to notice this in John chapter 19, 20, 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is, it is finished. Another way of saying that is, it is accomplished. What did Jesus Christ accomplish when he, where, was, where did he say this? Where did Jesus Christ say it was finished? When he was at the cross at Calvary when he was suspended between the two thieves, when he was suspended between heaven and earth, Jesus Christ bowed his head and said, it is finished, it is accomplished. I have accomplished that which the Father has sent me to do. I shall not return to the Father, to God, void, but I shall return and the one that sent me shall be satisfied. Now, there's scripture for that. Isaiah chapter 53, verse uh, 11. Let's just read verse 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand and it shall prosper in the thing where to I sent it. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God was satisfied when Jesus Christ said it was finished at the cross at Calvary, knowing that he had accomplished the work the Father had sent him to do. God Almighty was satisfied in that work, knowing that everyone that Jesus Christ died for had atoned and reconciled them to God. Full redemption had been made by the word of God. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, gives us the purpose for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And she shall bring forth a son, a message from the angel, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Notice this last part. For he shall save his people from their sins. It doesn't say that he shall save all people without exception. 
but it says this, what people shall he save from their sins? He shall save his people. Jesus Christ came into the world to accomplish the salvation of his people. Now that should make, that makes pretty good sense to us. There is his people and there's a people that's not his people. And the people that's not his people, he did not save them from their sins. But dearly beloved, aren't you thankful that all those that he came to save are those that he saved? All of the sin. Now, he shall save. I can't uh, find the words to express the jubilation that I feel inside of me when I'm able to say that Jesus Christ saved all the sins of all his people. That means that all of those people have been saved eternally or fully redeemed to God. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want us to have an understanding of this 50, uh, 11th verse of 50, chapter 55 in Isaiah when it's talking about this word that came forth from the Lord is talking about Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, the Apostle Paul said he has the ministry of reconciliation. And you know what? That's what ministry I have. The ministry of reconciliation. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 6, uh, 16. This word... This Bible does not give us reconciliation, but it tells us about reconciliation and it tells us about the one that brought us reconciliation to God or has reconciled us to God. Therefore, 17, 2 Corinthians 17, 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's pretty clear, don't you think? How have you been reconciled to God? In the word of the Lord, or Jesus Christ. You've been reconciled by the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. All things, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us, to himself. God reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. If you're reconciled to God, that means your sins have been forgiven. That means you're in full fellowship with God. You, had, you remember our iniquities and our sins had separated us from that. In reconciliation, we have been brought back. We, there is full remission of sins to those that Christ died for. In the Lord, in the word of Isaiah 55, 11, we have full remission, we are fully redeemed, we have been fully reconciled to God. That's why Jesus Christ should bow his head and said, it is finished. The work that I was sent to do, I have accomplished. It's prospered in my hand. Therefore, I shall ascend back to the Father. Jesus Christ is alive today in his resurrected body and is seated at the right hand. He is there, dearly beloved. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world, the world in which he was sent to save unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us this word of reconciliation. You know, in Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus Christ says this. Then said I, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, 
Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, to take away the first, that he may be a, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Notice this. There's one sacrifice. There is one sacrifice that reconciled God's people to God. There's one. But this man, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. After he had offered one sacrifice, who was the offering to? It wasn't to me and it wasn't to you. It wasn't to the devil. It wasn't to Satan. But this offering was to the Father. This offering was to God. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. You ever been asked the question, uh, once, do you believe if you're once saved, you're always saved? You ever heard that question? This right here says that he's offered one sacrifice for sins forever. So if you're reconciled to God once, you're always reconciled to God. So if you're saved, you're saved forever. You can't be unsaved. Verse 14, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. <clears throat> In verse 28 of chapter 9, it says, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So let us uh, review this just for a moment. So in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and 11, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. We see that, we see that accomplishment. We are alive because of that accomplishment. So likewise, Shall the Lord Jesus Christ go forth from God? It shall not return unto him unaccomplished, but accomplished. It shall not return unto him void. And it shall accomplish that which I please. Aren't you thankful that it was pleasing to God to send his son into this world to be a sacrifice for the sins of his people? It was pleasing to God. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So as we study throughout the word of God, we have to discern the purpose of the word in which it's speaking about. This written word, the scriptures, the gospel message, which I love and I love to speak about and I like to hear about it. It stirs me up, but it does not give me life. It lets me know about my life. It lets me know where my life came from. It lets me know about what I have to look forward to in my next life. It lets me know that I have eternal life. So this gospel is of great weight and importance, but it doesn't give life, but it brings all that to light. But the word of God, the word of the Lord, that is Jesus Christ, that word gives us life. Aren't you thankful when Jesus said, because I live? Jesus Christ was crucified. He died. He was buried in a tomb but he rose again the third day. And Jesus says, because I live, ye shall live also. That word did not return to God void. And I would say he would not have returned if it was not in full accomplishment of what God had sent him to do to save his people from their sins forever. So verse 12 says this, we shall go out with joy. We shall be led forth with peace. We have a, we have a peace in this world. God bless her, Sister Jewel is laying there just uh, in her bed, uh, knowing that 
anticipating the end is near, I believe. With joy and peace. Because she knows of this word that came into this world and saved her from her sins. May God add his blessing. May we go forth. May we be go out and shout and be joyful and appreciate the peace we have in Jesus Christ. May God add his blessing. Much more could be said about that. We publish the doors of the church open for the reception of members. Uh, if there's any that would like to have a home here, you have the opportunity to let it be known as we stand and sing a hymn. Brother Gene, what number? Number 370. <clears throat> 370. 370. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden
It's been brought out. If anybody would stand in with us following that, we'll have a conference meeting. Uh, yes, Brother Andy, for, for conference, all I have is just read the letter um, and get everyone's input for um, the association. When I call my hand. Well, I mean, if we want to read that down during lunch or something like that, we maybe can still do one of those. If there's not anything else, we could y'all put a chair to read that out. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Lord willing, uh, we'll be meeting Wednesday evening online. Elder uh, Carlock will be leading in that service. Uh, we'll be going out of town. So pray for our safe travel, if you will. Any other announcements? We have a lot to be thankful for. You know, Brother Kevin, had, he was ending up his prayer, you know, it was like, let us not be complacent. And all the good, you know, we just take for granted uh, we're able to stand up and put our shoes on and, you know, just walk outside and uh, go to the food line and get a loaf of bread if we need it. And all that, all that's a blessing from God. Uh, you know, and that's this much compared to the spiritual blessing, but all of it's a blessing from God. If it's a gift, every good and perfect gift comes down from above. Uh, let us not, uh, what's well, easy to do, isn't it? You just forget about thinking all the time. Thanking all the time that God has blessed us with. Is there any other now? Oh, Curtis, if you would close it with me. That's right. Amen. Amen.